And here is uh, the computational calculus. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, when you have a, a, a match bug? Yeah, yeah, there's a, a, a bug in the pattern matching. Um, yes, we can show this. Uh, let's see, boy, I don't need to. So this is, um, yeah. No, don't need that. Uh, yeah, give me one second to get this stuff up. So uh, this is a rolling bug. Uh, yeah, rolling bug. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, I, maybe you can help me find a roll line, uh, my rolling bug when. when oh yeah. Going. Okay. Um, let's. See. Oh, but this is bug with uh, with the rolling, not inside the rolling. <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait. What's what's the distinction here? I mean, if uh, uh, Jim is talking about the bug in, in the code, right? And this is the bug in the interpreter, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, boy, how am I going to explain this? I didn't really, let me just put it out there. I didn't prepare to show this, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, so, so let me separate so is this. this is this in your framework code, or is this, did you No, no, no. This is like uh, the rolling interpreter, like, you know, um, R node giving giving some sort of weird uh, answers for questions that we ask it. Um, hmm. So uh, so it, the the question that I was asking Tomislav, I, I didn't have R node running on my computer at the time, so I was talking to Tomislav about it, and uh, and then you know we just started finding some interesting peculiarities in the code, and um, so. One thing that I was interested in is how they do matching of something like, uh, you know, a, a receive expression with uh, multiple listens in, in the receive. So, like, for example, um, you know, I, I have this, this uh, receive that is listening for some process that is another receive. Um, and specifically, we wanted multiple channels. So, we're just looking at two channels in this case. Uh, so basically, the, the question is, how does the pattern matching even work for uh, a process like a receive that has multiple listens? That was kind of the question. And um, the answer is inconsistently. But um, so I'll, I'll try to demonstrate how it's inconsistent. So, uh, so we have this receive that we're listening for. Um, so we're, you know, we're just listening on channel A and then running this in par with some send on channel A. So presumably this, you know, may or may not produce some com event. Um, and, and if it does, what we're going to do is, uh, essentially just take whatever binds to the first channel and, you know, print it out here as like, this is the thing that bound to the first channel and whatever bounds, uh, binds to the second channel. We'll do the same thing here, print it out, like this is what bound to the second channel. Um, and so something strange that happens is we, we run this code, there is a com event, um, even though I, at the time my understanding was uh, maybe this needed to be a syntactic match or something, but uh, that's not the case. Um, so, but either way, uh, we, we have, so this, this receive here is gonna match with uh, this receive, in such a way that uh, the first channel apparently is getting bound to uh, B and the second channel is getting bound to A. Uh, and so let me talk about why that's a little bit surprising. So let's just notice like how these receives are constructed. Uh, so, so this receive that we're sending uh, is constructed in such a way that the message from this channel A uh, is, you know, we're going to take it as a process variable and then that's exactly what our continuation is, right? Like no alteration whatsoever. That's just exactly the continuation. And then whatever message it received from B, well, we bound it to this process variable Y, but we literally don't do anything with it. So this is kind of like a useless variable. Um, and so why is it surprising that this is the output from uh, this com event? Uh, because let's, let's look at this receive that we're trying to match. Uh, so we're saying that in this receive we're trying to match the stuff that we get from channel one, well, we bind it to this process variable X1, uh, and that's what goes into our continuation unaltered. 
and what we get from channel two, you know, we bind it to this name variable y1, uh, but you know, this this isn't used whatsoever in the continuation. It's kind of a useless variable. Um, but notice that we're we're basically trying to say that channel one, you know, this listen is sort of playing the same role as this listen in these two receives for the reason that, uh, you know, it's like whatever information we get from this channel one, we're just binding it to some process variable and then that's our continuation. So it's basically just like whatever we got from that channel, like that's our continuation. Uh, and we don't use anything from this listen whatsoever. Uh, and in this, this one that we're trying to match with it, um, it's whatever we're getting from this channel A, that's what's going into the continuation. And what we get from channel B is like just totally useless. We don't even use that information. Um, but notice that the matching is happening so that it's channel one that's binding to B. So we have this stuff basically saying that it should match up with the channel whose information we don't use whatsoever. So the channel whose information we're actually using is matching up with a channel that we're not using the information from. That seems kind of weird. Um, and then, you know, obviously then, then the, the other channels match too then. So, so this channel that we're not using information from is somehow matching up with the channel that we are using information from. And can you explain one more time why you're using information from A? And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So si simply for the reason that whatever comes in on this channel A, uh, we're just finding it to this variable X, right? And then X is the continuation of this receipt. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, so we're, so we're basically just saying like, whatever comes in on channel A, like that's what we're gonna use in the continuation. Whatever comes in on channel B, I, I mean, I could have literally put a wild card there. We're not even using that that stuff. Um, mm, yeah. And so, and so this is weird because it's exactly the opposite situation in, in this receipt that we're trying to match, right? It's like what the stuff we're getting on channel one is what we use in the continuation and the stuff we get on channel two, we're basically just throwing away. But then the binding is happening in kind of the opposite way that you would expect. It's like this, uh, you know, so we're saying channel one is binding with, with, uh, with B, but that's saying the channel whose information we use is binding with the channel whose information we don't use, which just seems really strange. Yeah. Then what happens if you, what happens if you use uh, B instead of A? Uh, a B here. If you use Y. Oh yeah, if we use Y, I don't remember if we specifically tried yeah. that, but we can uh, we can we can definitely try it right now. It is it is one strange situation. Uh, it depends uh, if you if you replace A this uppercase A with a C, you, you will get different result. Yeah, it's a different situation, and then also uh, you cannot replace uh, wildcard with the Y. You, you remember, uh, we don't have com if you if we replace uh, wildcard because we must match the wildcard in the in the in the matching. Yeah, it, it's super weird. It, it just doesn't seem like there are really well thought out rules for how this matching is supposed to work. Um, uh, let's see what I'm trying to do here. So I got, oh yeah, let's just open this one and then we'll make a new one. Uh, I don't know if it's bugged, but we'll, we'll check. Uh, okay, so, oh, dang it, I'm doing something different here. That's not the one I wanted. Oh, well. So it's oh, this is another <laughs> strange. Yeah, this is, this is another one. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so let's see, I think I'm, ah, no, I think I need to get rid of that, okay. Uh, so we're more or less, okay, so this was the situation we were just dealing with. And uh, let, me, let me just test it to make sure it, it comes out the way that we think it should. Yeah, okay, cool. So this is exactly the situation we were just looking at. Um, should I make my screen a little bit bigger? Can you, you guys see that fine? Uh, if you can make it bigger, you can. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, nice. Okay. So, uh, so that's the situation we were just doing, and you were saying, what if we change this to something else? Like, let's let's switch the, let's switch those, right? Why not? Um, and then let's see what happens. Yeah, there's no comma event. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, that's not good. It's strange, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very strange. Uh, or uh, I guess maybe maybe what Jim was saying was, let's put A there and B there. So this is exactly how we had it set up. And instead of using X, let's use Y there. I don't, I don't remember if we even tried that, um, but let's see what happens. But no combat. And if you, now if you switch A and B. <laughs> oh, now if we switch A and B. Oh boy, let's see. B and... Maybe okay. this will work. Oh, yeah, let's see. Hopefully this works. Oh, I had... oh hey, it did work. Yeah, it totally depends on... Yeah, I, I don't even... <laughs> on I, now I'm not even sure what it depends on because uh, I, I know there's something about the way that they're ordering these things and uh and it seems strange but either way i think like when you know so you can look at it in the in the indexed uh stuff that they give here oh no this is really weird oh they're doing it by the um by like the the variables in the in the listen that we have so i i, I don't know what people call this stuff but i've been calling these listening variables right like whatever I'm, you know, whatever bindings I have, like those variables in the bind, like there could be many of them, but I've just been calling them listening variables. Um, so either way, it looks like they're ordering the, um, you know, join by the, the index of the listening variables, I guess, because this one's two and this one's three. So that one came first, um, even though the way that we wrote it syntactically was exactly the opposite. Um, which is fine, but I think then it's like this ordering somehow is determining what's actually matching, which just seems weird. But uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking that maybe they are ordering by uh, the the name of the channel on which you are listening. Oh, the uh, I don't I don't think that's mm -hmm. the case. Let's let's see. I'll do it for a. I, we didn't. I, I didn't really. Oh yeah, on yeah. That when we did this the first time. Oh, and I think it doesn't scroll down now. Oh, maybe it is, but it's, oh, but again, it's still the same indexing. So uh, let's see, how can we make it? So uh, is there a way for us to make this one later? I don't think so. Oh, but uh, wait a second. Wait a okay, second. second. Are you saying that the ordering of the free names that it binds? Uh, oh, well, I'm I'm talking about the ordering of the channel itself. Oh, it does it yeah. does look like they're going yeah by the channel. So whatever is coming earlier, is, or so like A comes before B, so they're they're putting that yeah. that uh, listen first. Yeah. But is this make sense? Maybe because uh, this is like a pattern that you are sending, right? Well, it's it's not a pattern. It's. Uh, Uh, a pattern that we're sending. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, this, is, this is a closed process. I mean, you can't get yeah, more, yeah. more processy than than that one. Now. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense to to, to order by. by the yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, well, so either way, uh, this this is this is quite strange. <laughs> I'm not. I you know I thought I understood why it was matching the way that it was in the cases that it does match, but I'm not even sure I understand that anymore. But the, you, you uh, in your implementation, you find out that- well, Yeah, well, in my implementation, this is just not working yet because I realized that exactly what's happening here was gonna be an issue and uh, and I, I don't have a, a solution yet that, that I've have in code, um, yeah. I can I can maybe think of some potential solutions, but I haven't actually gotten anything to work uh, the way that I want it to yet. I don't have time to go back and look at it, but is this related to the the thing that Jim Worm posted uh, a week or so ago? Oh uh, no, that that's a little bit different. He was uh, he was talking about when you're when you're. Well, I, I mean, I don't know actually. Uh, cause he was talking about when you're matching. So like, um, if this is like some R expression, basically, uh, he was wondering why it wasn't kind of like randomly 
choosing the two possible bindings. Um, okay. Yeah. But I think that one is probably, uh, I, I didn't look into it all that much, but um, what he was saying wasn't clearly a bug or anything. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I would just, that's what I thought at the time, but yeah. this is starting to look vaguely similar, but I'm not sure I understand it well enough to, to say much more about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and then uh, we can show the the bug with uh, when you when you have this as a match construct too. Um, let's see, maybe I can just go back to all of that. Oops, a little too far back. All right. Change. Okay, cool. So, oh yeah, and there's some really weird stuff that happens with uh, when you put a match thing here. So, so we noticed that that was happening, right? Like, okay, so before what we had was basically just like an A or a B or something, um, and now what we're uh, trying to look at was uh, we wanted to see if we, you know, wrap all of that stuff in like a, a match statement and have, uh, you know, like some variable bindings coming from the match statement and then, you know, uh, placing values in these channels and then see, see if it still happens there. And uh, we found some even, even weirder bugs when we started doing that sort of thing. Um, I don't specifically remember if this code works, but I guess we can we can just look at it for a second. So everything is exactly the same, except now now this channel is, has a variable which we called xx, and then that should be bound to a from from uh, this match statement basically because we're just saying like we're matching this this tuple a b mm -hmm. with this tuple you know xx and whatever. I mean we don't even care what the second value is. Uh, so so. X, X should be bound to the string A. So it, effectively it should be the same as one of these, uh, one of these, uh, one of the code uh, that we already ran, um, but I, I don't remember how this one comes out. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, so now, now we're saying that with an A and a B that there is no comma event. Uh, and I wanna say that is not what we were just dealing with. But um, let's see, I think I might have it in here. Yeah, A, B, yeah, okay. So here's, here's a, a super weird thing. So uh, this is, for all intents and purposes, this, this is exactly what we just ran minus the match statement. Um, so not having the variable binding coming from match statement, like I already just have the string A here on this first channel. Uh, okay, there's a comma event in a weird way, which hopefully I made a good case for why this is a strange binding of these variables. Um, and then once we make this string A now some variable and we wanna bind that variable through a match statement, like here, now all of a sudden there's no comma event. That right there should be the bug investigated wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my claim is that this is a bug and then this is an additional bug. Okay. Cause this isn't even, this isn't even, uh, executing in a consistent way with how this executed, even though I think this, this might be the wrong way to do it. You think it's a serious bug in, as far as, uh, Difficulty in fixing it? I mean, uh, I like I don't know what the implications are of any bug, really. I don't think I have the, the expertise to, to comment on any of that stuff. Um, but uh, I, I don't think it's a, a complicated solution. I just think it, it um, has to take into account more, more of the, the relationship between like where the information that we're, you know, like, this information that we're getting from these channels we're listening on, like how that relates to what's in the continuation. I, I, I don't see that as being something that was taken into consideration here. And I see that as something that needs to be taken into consideration. And this also seems just, just this part uh, seems uh, that is solvable just by structural equivalence, right? Without uh, this relation set that you, that you are uh, trying to add. Right, because it's just position in the in the continuation. Yeah. Right. 
Um, you don't have any other uh, strange situation, right? Oh, I mean, I don't know. This is, I, I didn't uh, test any more to see what happens if... Uh, no, no, I mean, I mean from, from your implementation. Uh, yeah, when yeah. you have two listens, uh, right, you, you just compare the first and the second, uh, the channels and what is in, in the continuation. You yeah, have yeah. Additional relations. Uh, right. So, to, I mean, in a, in a case where we have uh, two, two binds that are happening or two listens, uh, I, I think, you know, in that case specifically, it's fairly straightforward. Like, there's only two possibilities for, for ordering these things anyways. Um, but, but I'm always thinking of the general case, right? So like if I have n uh, listens here, how, how are we in general gonna make sure that we're matching up the right listens with the, you know, the, the right things here? And, uh, and, and I'm not even sure it's clear what, what it means uh, for it to be the right one because I, I think there may potentially be multiple ways to do it, but I haven't, I haven't done enough investigation yet to say one way or another. So you just you think consistency is important, but uh, but maybe not. It doesn't matter which way we do it. We just got to be consistent. Well, uh, so so I'm saying there's kind of two two different bugs here, right? So the the first one is uh, the fact that um, so so I think the flow of information needs to be considered in this matching business, and and, and it doesn't look like it is being considered in the matching. Uh, because so, so my argument is like from channel one, we are taking that information and that's our continuation. So somehow like that's the thing that we want to match that relationship between like where I got the information and how I'm using the information needs to be preserved in, uh, the process that matches it. At, at least that's, that's my, uh, that's my, um, uh, thesis or whatever, uh, and, and that's not happening in this pattern matching because we're saying that this bind is matching with this one, basically, uh, but we're not even using the information that we're getting from channel B in the continuation, right? Whereas we are using the information we got from channel one in this continuation. And, and I think that's wrong. So, so I think that's the, the first issue. But the second issue is like, okay, like forget everything I just said. Uh, this has a particular output, right? Like uh, when I put an A here and a B here, like for all intents and purposes, it's the same stuff, right? Uh, when I put an A and a B there, it says it, it comes out like this, that channel one should bind with B, channel two should bind with A, regardless of the fact that I don't think that's the way that it should work. Certainly uh, when I just match some variable XX and that variable stands here and I match it with an A, this should execute in exactly the same way as this code. Like no matter uh, whether this is a right or wrong execution, this should have the same outcome. Uh, the problem is it has no outcome. It doesn't, there's no comma event here, which seems very strange. Isaac, have, have yeah. you uh, opened a Jira ticket on this? I, I did, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I don't want to say how long it took me to do that, but I, I did open a Jira ticket. So you wouldn't happen to know the, the ticket number because I'd be interested oh, in watching it. Yes, I do have a ticket number. Um, yeah, I also, uh, I also posted a, a message in the, the, the dev server just telling them about it because I wasn't sure if I'd done things correctly. Um, yeah, I can tell you in one second. It is 3756. 3756. Cool. Yeah. yeah I'm, uh, you know, whenever we open up a ticket from our group, um, because yeah. uh, NetZipper, he opened one uh, yeah. last yeah. week. So I'm watching these tickets that we open up and oh, cool. kind of see how, uh, you know, I know the, the core dev team, they've got a lot going on. But right. um, you know yeah. we're we're part of the <laughs> the effort to to uh, move things forward. So it'll be yeah. interesting to see how much attention these tickets get and yeah. how quickly they get resolved. Right, right, yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, uh, I think unfortunate. Well, so like I'm not familiar enough with 
uh, like the Scala code for, for the pattern matching. So I, I can't really comment on any, you know, anything about how it's written. Um, but ju just from running these tests, it doesn't seem like this stuff was a consideration, I guess. And, and so I, I think it might actually take some, some real like reworking and, and, you know, thinking about how this stuff is done to, to actually impose well i mean unless unless we just say like oh we don't really care like this is this is a fine execution of this code and then just like just make this consistent i think that's a, a way easier thing to do uh but to make this work out the the way that i'm proposing and in the general case i, I don't think it's a trivial thing right Does right. your implementation in the k framework uh, support this kind of like information flow uh, that that's that is exactly what I'm working on. Uh, I haven't I haven't fully solved how to do it, but I, I definitely have ideas for how it could be done. Is it does it really add a lot of like computational complexity to the problem? Like, are you having to recursively follow continuations? Uh, so it it does um at, like i you know i don't have any analytics to say like specifically how much it will add um but like fact of the matter is uh this this is like simultaneous binds right like we don't care what order these things appear in and because we don't care what order these things appear in a priori we have no clue as to what the right order is so really we just have to test all orders until something works um I don't know if there's a more efficient way to, to do it or think about it, um, but I think that might be the only way, uh, just because these are completely unordered. Hmm. And, and something as simple, and so I thought something that would work, uh, a really simple thing that would work is just like, just ordering everything in a canonical way, and then like, if it doesn't match in that ordered way, then it, then it doesn't match. But that's just not true in general, because like, if you have variables and values mixing, like it, that just doesn't work the way I want it to. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm not, like I said, I don't, I don't have something working that I can say like, here's how it should be. Um, I have ideas and like some, some like small stuff that's working, I guess. I mean, just from the way you describe it, I can definitely see intuitively how it should work. Yeah. And I mean, it makes sense when I'm looking at the continuation right there. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, hopefully, hopefully people agree that it's kind of weird that, that we're getting this matching of channel one with B and channel two with A, uh, just from like the, the, the way that the relations are working in these bindings and the continuations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, what I, what I will say is, uh, e even though I don't fully have like an implemented solution for this stuff, it's because I've been thinking about this stuff that I even thought like, Hey, maybe I should check how our node is telling me this stuff should execute. And then like, Oh wait, that's real weird that, uh, it's coming out in a way that I don't think should be right. Um, and then like, and that's kind of what led me to start investigating this a little bit further is, is, uh, you know, thinking about it independently and then looking to see what they've done. And, um, you know, and, and this is, and this is what I found. It's funny that there's even that discontinuity there. You're, you're doing research for our chain, right? Yeah. Yeah. Our project is right. And you're just trying to formalize, uh, relying into the K framework. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. You're also pushing the boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, uh, yeah and maybe it's just because of the the person i am or like how i think but like i feel like i can't move on to do anything until like i figure out exactly how this one like little tiny thing works you know and I'll, like, for like a week or two like trying to think about exactly how this binding should work and uh and maybe other people aren't like that and they're just like ah this is good like something's working like let's let's move on like we have all of this stuff to do so like let's just start making progress. I mean, I don't know, that's speculation, obviously, but you know, uh, I, I can definitely speak for myself. I feel like I can't move on to anything else until I figure this out. No, it, it seems important. And I mean, I, I don't know how it, it really works, but yeah. in, you know, my ideal situation, I would, you know, want even like the biggest of programs when reflected yeah. as, as channels to be matched on. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Right. And so like this, this pattern matching is super important, right? Like it's gonna, it's gonna do a lot with, uh, like a lot of rolling execution depends on this pattern matching. It's kind of like a cornerstone. So like it, it should really work well. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you on that. Yeah. Can you, uh, what kind of use cases for patterns like this do you think of? Oh yeah. See, well, see, that's the thing is I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. Like, is this like something that I'm fixating on? And it's like, just not really that important. Or is this like, you know, something that could like make or break a platform? I, I mean, I have no idea and it's definitely somewhere in between, but, uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know where that falls and I don't specifically have a use case, honestly. Um, because I'm, I'm mostly just thinking about this stuff abstractly, right? Like, uh, like this is something that could potentially come up and if it does, like, how is it supposed to work? And, um, and, and I mean, my, my claim is that it's not working in a satisfactory way. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, like one thing is right. Uh, one solution could be like, oh, we just don't allow patterns like this. Sorry, you know, like error, like this pattern is not allowed. Um, th that's certainly a solution. I don't know if it's a satisfactory solution. It definitely uh, avoids all of this, you know, thinking about like, oh, wow, we got to like permute all of these things around. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's a good way to go. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, but certainly what, what is currently implemented doesn't seem satisfactory. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't have a specific use case for it, um, but um, yeah. There's been a lot of talk, especially with Tomislav, about how Verlang can be used as a graph query language. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you know much more about that and how that like correlates with pattern matching? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that, Tomislav. I, I, yeah, I don't really know about that at all. Oh, my Zoom is a little slow. Uh, I, I remember that uh, Greg was uh, talking about uh, per, uh, that in, in rolling, uh, we will have something like a prologue terms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 uh, uh, with the variables, you can, uh, in a sense, uh, see this as a, as a, a query. Mm -hmm. So with uh, if uh, if we have uh, uh, some some rolling term, we can put uh, variables in place of, uh, of data that we want to uh, receive uh, from, from from this database. And in, in that sense, it's like a query language in the in the in the, the, in the basic sense. Um, so I I looked into Prolog a very little bit. Um, do they? use like the horn clauses? Is that kind of like the, the structure of like a prologue program? I'm, I'm not familiar with, with this term. Oh, okay. But I've heard of it. I'm pretty sure that it is. I don't really know what horn clauses are either, but. It's, it's a way of turning uh, in input. It's like a, a normal form for like an implication, basically. Mm. Um, yeah, so it, yeah. it's like everything is written as like an axiom that implies some stuff, right? Or like when you combine axioms, they, they imply other things. Um, but I think there, it's just like a normal form for, for writing that stuff. Yeah, where, where a lot of languages do like forward deduction, you know, by reduction, like yeah. beta reduction. Prolog yeah. basically works by backward, backward deduction oh. or backward thinking. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I mean, you're just like, writing out a description of like some logical statement and then you write a variable for one of its terms and it'll solve for that variable. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's cool. I, I, I see this in Roland, yeah. Oh, you see like something like that working in Roland? Uh, if, if we have something in, in par, right? Yeah, yeah. And we select, uh, uh, we want to find all the all the matches, right? Yeah. We can we can we can have uh, 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 many results, and we can collect these results 
as a, like a, something that we that is a, a answer to our query. Yeah. Hmm. I, I was thinking that we already have like strings. They are not they are not uh, combined from from uh, smaller pieces. So because I, I was thinking how to how to write uh, uh, like a query query for for a string. You, you don't want to store it as a string. You want to store it as a character and then you want to match, right? So you, you don't have access to the individual characters? I mean, we have. Sort of do. But yeah, you can store it as a, in a list and something like that. Right? But like in interpolation, well, I guess interpolation doesn't quite have access to the individual characters. Yeah, never mind. Hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking that if we want to search, uh, if if we want to find the the letter B, right, in, on the second place, and, and we will match A B C, uh, uh, C B A, right. So we want to put you know, on the first and the and the third place. We want to uh, uh, put a variable and the B on the middle, right, and we want to match. Yeah. Uh, Right, and we want to say, give me all the all the string that that has B in the middle. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure that this is like an easy way to do it now in your own. I was thinking that this will be like more more uh, basic to, to to do. But yeah, there's no like uh, there's no character operator or anything like that in Rolling, right? Like I can't just say like, give me the character, you know, the third character of like this, you know, 10 character string or whatever. Yeah. My feeling has always been that it needs a regular expression language. <laughs> regular expression language, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, if you could use regular expressions, then yeah. we do everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the problem is that uh, regular expression is not uh, the, the, like, the, the rolling. Right. If, if, if this uh, regular expression is implemented in, in, in rolling, uh, then I think it's well, it's okay because it, it has the rolling structure. But if, if this uh, uh, came from somewhere outside, we don't have a re reflection. We cannot match on the <laughs> on the you know on, on this code that does this. Uh, uh, well, regular. I see. So if if, you, uh, if the if, if the regular expressions were only uh, uh, were only for matching, okay, you could just add it to the language. For matching, okay, like addition, you know, or subtraction. It's just something it does. But if Regular expressions can change the strings, then you uh, you can't use reflection. Is that the idea? You see I'm, just, I'm, I'm thinking that how can uh, how how can we destructure uh, the regular expression? And uh, well, maybe it we can have some kind of wrapper. Uh, it could be de destructured with another regular expression. Right? We could use regular expressions to destructure roll line code, also. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, not, yeah, now, now I'm thinking that maybe we can represent regular expression in, in some rolling terms like a structure for for constructing regular expression and then we can we can store this uh, this structure yeah yeah can you match on that structure maybe? yeah yeah we can match on this structure we can we can say we have all of these constructors for regular expression and we can construct it right right just can, extension as you know, it's an yeah, extension yeah. to the to the to the matching that we already have. Yeah, right? yeah matching directly on string and yeah. Okay, 
XML for someone who just found out about regular expressions like three months ago. Can you can you explain exactly what the what the goal is here? <laughs> Well, in my head, I'm thinking how to uh, how to match on the string uh, if we want to store uh, a string is in, in our da database. How can we match yeah. Yeah, yeah. different different strings? You know, okay. Uh, for example, if string begins with uh, these characters or ends with this character or okay. Other, so, so you're saying that uh, you know somebody sent some strings on a particular channel that you know the channel of and you're trying to like query that channel to see like what are all the strings that start with the character a or something along those lines yeah okay okay cool yeah, yeah. that makes sense and I, i'm still not sure is it the right way to just store a string if we if we have a string is, is it okay to just store a string or uh, or uh, we need some kind of uh, uh, like a tree structure where we store each character that we can match and yeah because and then, oh, okay I see what you're saying about reflection now is that like the reflection you store it as like the program tree structure and then you when you reflect it it becomes just this name that is the string yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And the, uh, for A, we have all the all the words that start with A. For B, for C. Mm. I see. You know that you know the regular expression is you know, is a way you can match any pattern. You're looking for some pattern on a channel. Okay, and whether you know the the, the what, whether the regular expression knows about rolling terms strings or lists, whatever, is a matter of uh, optimization, in my view. Okay. Exactly. It's, yeah. it, you know, there are situations, you know, in most cases, a character string is just, is just fine as a character string. But if you have 10 million of them that you're matching against, you, you know, you want to use a, 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 a different structure. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. I'm thinking how to uh, implement the indexing uh, inside the rolling, right? Not just store string as a as string, like a 10 million string. Uh, uh, how to implement some kind of indexing that is part of the rolling, uh, um, the, the structure that is built, right? That we can, that we can efficiently uh, search. And that's why I call it, say it's an optimization because there isn't one good way, there isn't one right way to do it. I mean, really, yeah, yeah. I'll use uh, uh, the, uh, I guess, uh, you know, um, Greg was uh, using uh, the prologue terms. For, uh, uh, as an indexing, which you know, um, I wasn't uh, entirely clear how useful that was, but, but um, uh, you know, I think that you know, it, it, it takes it takes a bit of pragmatics. I mean, you want conceptually regular expression because I would suggest that. Uh, the regular expressions are uh, general in terms of recognizing uh, patterns, but not Turing complete. Yeah. Um, there. Uh, uh, and we have uh, Peter. With the screenings. <laughs> do we know? Uh, do you, uh, I did. I guess we had uh, uh, Peter drop by last week. Can you speak, Peter? Yeah. So, first of all, first question what's those bugs that I've uh, saw was uh, all about? They are from testing uh, R node or something like that. Mm, the ones that you Isaac was presenting. Uh, that was running our node 
uh, very obscure matching um, uh, matching receives. Okay, and we don't know why you would want to match receives, but we were wondering what it does and what it's supposed to do. <laughs> what, what do we think it should do? <laughs> Yeah, well, why do you want to match anything? What it, what it does doesn't seem to make sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Claim is it doesn't make sense. <laughs> mm, you, you mentioned that you're uh, doing a specification of Erl. Uh, Erl, uh, Erl well, Relling? Yeah. Relling, yeah. So, uh, K framework. So, yeah. how this yeah. is going uh, that's out of. Oh, I mean, no, I don't know how to answer that question. I think it's it's going well some days, and other days I feel like I'm not making any progress. So I don't know. I guess it's uh, kind of the the usual situation, I assume. Yeah, but you have uh, like big stuff already already implemented. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like but um, very, yeah. yeah, I think I have some some good things that work, and uh, and then some very big gaps where things are are not working. Uh, oh, and, and I, I asked my question. I know, I, I think I, I talked to you, Thomas Love, about this. I don't remember if I was talking to other people. So, uh, so one thing that I've had an issue with is, uh, so, so the way that I'm using the configuration in K framework, uh, because it's like a, it's a multi-set. Uh, so I was thinking like, well, this is a good idea. I'll just use this multi-set um, to do things like, um, uh, so what's an example? So to do things like take receives that are listening for multiple messages and then like kind of treat each one of those like bindings as like an element in a multiset, and then I can try to like match these elements to see if I have a, a consume that will or like um, a communication event that will happen um, amongst multiple sends with this, you know, uh, receive that's listening on all of these channels at the same time. Uh, and, and the only way that I see to do it is to be able to use functions on the, on the configuration itself. Um, it, that doesn't seem to work the way that I want it to. Uh, and, and I've, I've asked a question because they, they have like an a, a email list and I've asked questions there before and immediately got responses. And I asked this question like two weeks ago and haven't heard anything back from anybody. So I don't, I don't know if it's just like, something that they didn't do or I, I don't I don't know I mean it could have been as simple as like yeah that doesn't work and uh, you know let's move on with our lives but I, I haven't heard back from anybody so it's a little bit concerning I guess Maybe. so I might, I might need to figure something else out for uh, for, for these uh, simultaneous uh, receipts I guess is what I'm saying uh, do you have any thoughts uh, if it is uh, super hard to specify uh, let's say semantic for a language like Scala, because uh, they have already done this for C for core Haskell, and I was wondering if it would be like super cool to have this in Scala, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they've also done it for Java as well. I, I, I don't know specifically what version, um, but my my uh, thinking is if they've done it for Java, it's probably possible for Scala. But I I'm not familiar enough with either Java or Scala to really like have any thoughtful yeah. comments about that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's something that is on my mind. I don't know what. It yeah. seems interesting. I, I think it would be cool if the specification would exist for Scala as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, sorry for this uh, questions. Uh, the question was what I was up to for the last time. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was on a very interesting summer school um, in um, Let's Go. It was about, um, well, type theory. Uh, there was a couple of lectures about, uh, one lecture about category theory, about uh, um, probabilistic programming, and very interesting uh, stuff about um, programming in Agda, uh, done by... Uh, Colonel Mark Bright, super interesting stuff. I'm trying to learn enough uh, Agda to like. Um, what was the last thing? Sorry. What was the last thing? Uh, so there, there was a lecture by uh, Connor McBride about um, some stuff he's doing in uh, Agda. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Agda language. It's 
similar like Idris, that was like a topic in a couple of uh, meetings, I believe. Um, so I would like to understand this stuff enough to, um, well, to be able to reason about what people are doing with type theory, because there's a lot of stuff happening around homotopy type theory, cubical type theory, all this kind of stuff. If I get this, um, like if I digest this enough to be able to talk about this, I would gladly bring this up on those uh, on those uh, sessions. If you are interested, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, do do you uh, do you have any Agda code? I, I haven't seen Agda. I've heard of it being used for a couple different projects, but I, I mean. You know, it's one of those things like there's like a thousand different languages and I'm not sure which one to, to look more deeply into. Uh, so from my point of view, Idris and Agda are the most advanced uh, functional programming languages that exist. Um, what I can, so there's uh, one repository about, it's like online book done by Philip Podler, I believe he could, Know this guy? Yeah, uh, oh, Philip Wadler, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I can share a link. Um, oh, cool. Um, okay, that, yeah, if you, uh, if you want to put it in the Discord, that would, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, on Discord. So here. Um, give me a first chat. Here it is. So this is a very cool book because it's about um, foundations of programming languages. So it talks about uh, type theory at the end, uh, about uh, simple typed lambda calculus, stuff like that. I don't know if it's a familiar topic to you. Um, anyway, I want to understand this because it's uh, in uh, lots of papers that I try to read. This uh, these things pop up, and I'm not able to read this. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, I need uh, this is a background knowledge to understand many many things. I believe this is similar to what um, Greg Maradit was uh, talking about in this introduction to um, sorry designing a computation calculator. Yeah, a bit yeah. different take. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm. <laughs> trying to understand nowadays. Not cool. I can't. I, I think another good resource is, uh, so Greg talks about this paper a lot. It's uh, Samson Abramsky, uh, the computational interpretations of linear logic. I, I think that's maybe another, another good resource if you're talking about uh, this like typed lambda calculus and like wanting to think about it in some different ways. Would you link that one? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can, I can definitely put that in Discord. Uh, let's see, I'll have to find it on the, do you want a link or do you just want the paper? Because I, I have the paper, so I can definitely just send that. Uh, either one. Yeah, let's see. Uh, I, can, I can post the link. Oh yeah, you, you have a link? Okay, cool. Yeah, I have the, all I can do. So, about the linear logic, um, yeah. the most, more advanced version of linear logic is something like uh, quantitative type theory, something like that. I've posed this on a, uh, not on a, uh, yeah, on a Slack some time ago. Um, I know that it is, um, it, is it, it, it will be implemented in uh, Idris, Idris too. Cool. Uh, I was thinking that maybe it is of interest uh, to like in uh, Roland because it, uh, this uh, theory talks about um, resource usages, yeah. uh, like memory and uh, computational like, gas. Yeah. Um, it seems interesting, but you, Thomas Love, said that it is like um, alternative to behavior types, or I'm mistaken in this? Yeah, uh, so uh, the, the, this linear bind is also uh, very uh, similar to, to linear types. Like, uh, if you send something on a, on a channel and then you uh, receive it, uh, it will not exist anymore. So you can only consume it once. Yeah. But uh, the variables are not linear. You can, you can use variables multiple times. 
right? But uh, communication between channels is uh, is only. And uh, Greg was also talking about uh, that you know it's very easy to implement session types. Like you have this uh, uh, channel communication; it's very similar to to session types. And and uh, and I see behavioral types as extension of that, so that you can right express exactly the the behavior, not not only the static. Uh, can you point me out to like resource to start uh, reading about behavioral types? Uh, maybe Isaac, uh, you maybe you know. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put some links in there. To, uh, yeah, so uh, Greg, Greg, and the uh, the other the co-author on uh, the Rocal paper, uh, which I've never seen him anywhere else except for on these two papers. Um, I think it's Matthias Radstock. Uh, they. They have a namespace logic, which is like specifically for um, like behavioral types for, for row calculus. Um, but then uh, also Louis uh, Kyres has some more general, less general. I'm not really sure how the relation goes, um, uh, but specifically about like higher order uh, pi calculus uh, types. So I'll, uh, I'll send some links on that. I see a paper about namespace logic, but the uh, other guy, I don't. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get you. Uh, well, actually, here, I'll just put the link to all his papers because he very nicely has them all displayed on his website. Uh, so, of this summer school, there was um, something about session types. If you're interested, there are slides from the talk, and I think that they, they are, it should be, you could uh, follow. Um, follow them without a problem. Um, well maybe I will link the... There, there is a, a lot of slides. <laughs> there we have it. <laughs> uh, there's like over one, 100, but that's, that's the good thing because <laughs> lead you exactly with how the lecture was uh, happening. Um, yeah. Mm. I have also one paper uh, that is uh, uh, talking about spatial and behavioral types in pi calculus. I didn't uh, read it, but <laughs> oh, is that is that Kyrie's? It's like a spatial behavioral observations or something. Uh, no, no. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Some different paper that I'm not sure how it's relevant to 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 your calculus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, gosh, there's just so much stuff on this page. I don't even know what to post in here. Uh, well, I'll post the two papers that I know are very useful, and then if you want to follow that, it's okay. Not okay for that. About my thoughts uh, about programming languages that are that are important to follow. Well, um, Idris is, uh, tends to. Um, Pick the practical uh, approach to, to programming. So it it it, it, it will uh, so uh, Edwin Bradley want this long language to be like practical, like Haskell or something like that. But Agda, I believe, don't uh, want to go this uh, route. They try to be like um, beginner friendly um, tool. Uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, proof assistant. So something that mm. allows you to write proofs uh, nicely. And the the reason why this language is like uh, cool is because uh, there is a lot of um, papers about dependent types. Uh, and they they will come to Scala in next year. So I'm trying to understand what mm. people already uh, done in dependent types. Oh, and okay. most of the papers are in Agda, so oh, okay. there's like no other way. <laughs> I, I need to learn this. Um, yeah, I like this uh, uh, this uh, notation in Agda that you can just uh, uh, underscore something, and this is the place for the variables. You can define the function like like an infix function with uh, 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 two arguments. And oh. you can put uh, uh, underscore for, for arguments, right? Yeah, this mix, mix, mixing. Uh, what's the name? Mix fix notation. Yeah, mix fix. Yeah, mix fix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
There's a, uh, I think they- It's uh, crazy when you write this, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> And, 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 and in, in this repository that uh, uh, Peter is talking about uh, from Colonel McBride, he was using this style. Oh, okay. and it's yeah. crazy to, 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 to read. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, I recently saw some Agda mix fix notation and uh, the ladle paper has uh, like a specification for a monoid or something and it's in Agda code. So they, they use that mix fix notation. But I, I thought it was, it was quite nice. Uh, at least the way they presented it there, it was it was nice. I don't know if in general it would, it would be nice to work with. But. Uh, I envy people from Agda and Idris. The, um, they think that they can uh, use some shortcut and they have like uh, <coughs> um, sorry case split or something like that, and you can like generate part of the implementation out of the type. This is super cool. I would like to. Mm have this in different languages as well. <laughs> yeah. That's also the part why I'm trying to understand this stuff. Mm. I haven't um, been inclined to get into these proof systems uh, lately, but um, I've been uh, uh, going through uh, Bartos, uh, Molosky's uh, category theory for programmers. Yeah. Uh, this and uh, uh, I, uh, it's sort of you know uh, All right. like go. putting putting things together in terms of categories as types, yeah. and um, uh, the uh, proofs for free notion, uh, which. Uh, in you know, specifying that I, um, I don't think I can uh, say it well yet. I have to get, get, go, finish the course and uh, get my terminology uh, straight. And, you know, the idea that, that um, uh, the, uh, you have a, uh, Okay, well, the category, you know, categories is types, and you're specifying, when you're specifying behavior, um, you're uh, uh, selecting from the set of functions, so to speak, uh, or the set of, uh, 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 in the category, uh, uh, the functions that uh, 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 that exhibit the kind of behavior that you're looking for, down to um, the particular function that you want, ultimately in the, as a limit, um, which in which you know addressing it, so to speak, or specifying it is the proof of correctness of the function, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. Um, yeah, you can. So how I what what I've uh, how I get it is like um, that if you um, because in functional programming you have a, a lot of restrictions on functions. So if you have a pure functions, if you have some property, for example, for a uh, something that is like a factor, you have a couple of properties guarantees, guaranteed, you can uh, for free get a lot of other properties, or for example, a lot of other functions that are properly in implemented for free. That's, that's super cool for me. I really like the fact that um, there are all these strange qualities. So from, um, uh, I believe Bartosz uh, uh, show some example how you could optimize um, some operation in, in lecture about natural transformations. Uh, sorry, maybe you're not there yet, Jim, and I'm getting... Not there yet. <laughs> okay, I will not spoil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I, I love the, the, the videos by, by Bartosz Pilewski. They are so... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
funny because if you go for a category theory like books and stuff like that, they are very dense and pretty much hard to understand if you you are not a professional mathematician. And uh, the the video lectures are almost understandable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> but so that, that's like the ultimate compliment for uh, for a category theory lecturer is almost understandable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, the thing is that you know he makes less, and there are certain things that he's brought up that you're not clear on. But by the time you go through two more lessons, he's clarified it. So yeah. <laughs> you, you, it's called you get it eventually if you keep watching this video. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> For me, it took uh, more than one time to watch them to understand the stuff. Yeah. There is a famous saying that if uh, that you don't understand category theory from the first book you read regardless what is the book, but you get it from the second one. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you can read it. It's also good. <laughs> in, in some of our cases, maybe the fifth one. <laughs> yeah. I, think, you know, I, I think it's the same, the same problem as quantum physics, and I don't think anybody understands it. Or ever will. <laughs> but <laughs> we can become uh, functional <laughs> in it. Um, oh, so so I think probably everybody here would be interested. Um, I am hoping to arrange uh, a meeting time with uh, Christian Williams to uh, start a, a group like this where we're meeting up and, and talking about category theory, and like hopefully eventually we'll we'll have it so that it's kind of like geared towards understanding the stuff surrounding our chain, but like we can start from total basics is kind of what I'm what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, and, and also uh, something that uh, he is interested in. Yeah, oh, and, and obviously very <laughs> yeah. uh, very fluent in and presents really well. So I think he can he can help all of us uh, understand this stuff a little better. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally for that. Yeah. <laughs> sounds that sounds cool. Yeah. Peter, I, I mentioned that uh, he can talk about uh, kind extensions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, trying to, uh, I'm trying to understand uh, currently vibrations. This is a crazy mm. topic. Uh, it's, well, mm, it, uh, it pop up subs in a, so there is a, um, let's, let me start somewhere at the beginning. There is nice papers, a paper about um, boom hierarchy. It's about a um, way to um, expre um, express every data structure like list, um, set, multi-set, tree. That's it. Uh, using um, a very similar framework, like uh, two constructs or so, something like that. So how the data structures deal with empty case and how it combines stuff. Uh, and uh, it turns out that fold is the way that you um, you can transform these data structures to anything else. But the nice nice thing is that you could um, organize those uh, data structures in that way that each data structure um, have some laws that that needs to be hold that needs hold. And if you go up, um, you can you throw away one one law. And you you get this hierarchy. Mm. Uh, this is uh, there is a paper about this. Uh, if you are like, interested in this topic, but it, it yeah. blew my mind when I yeah. saw this recently. Uh, it should be able to Google this. It's like boom hierarchy. Um, and you say this is related to yeah. So you, you can. Um, make a more complicated model of, of uh, data structures because you could have uh, you could include um uh, something like uh, simply type lambda calculus treat the, it as a data structure because you can uh, ex expresses uh, express expresses express it as a, a couple of constructors and some rules yeah so this uh, constructors form a data structure but it is um, 
a bit too complicated to express this as this hierarchy. Uh, so there's a couple of approaches to include this data structure, uh, simply type lambda calculus. It's like indexed uh, containers, uh, there's polynomial something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, this is nicely explained in a um, branch of math that is named um, initial algebra semantics. When you talk about um, uh, initial or terminal objects of um, some factors, but I'm we probably need some lectures about category theory. <laughs> this, this, goes back to, this, fully. this goes back to what I call the information problem, and <laughs> it relates to what we were talking before. It's like how do we re represent strings so that we can introspect these things and. You think the, 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 you know, one of the cool things that I got from Bartos is that, you know, I had always thought of categories as being like sets. And, you know, now I realize that a set is the antithesis of a category. A category is about structure. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and it, it, it's pattern, you know, uh, he presents it as pattern recognition which comes back to the information problem again. And what you're talking about here in terms of organizing the structure, hierarchies of structures is like, you know, uh, sort of like, uh, 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 I guess, uh, uh, getting a taxonomy of uh, structure uh, that uh, uh, has ideals in it. And all of, any ideal that we come up with is, it is wrong. It's full short. It's, you know, you know, and you know, all we're doing is we're putting together a lot of wrong things in order to make it almost right. <laughs> but, sorry, but why we are trying to, uh, why we are making uh, things wrong? Why do you say this? Yeah, well, the, you know, the structure is, you know, and, you know, it goes back to, you know, uh, you know, the natural orders are going to be, uh, uh, unrestricted. I mean, it's going to be, they're Turing complete. Uh, they're not going to, uh, 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 obey our rules. They won't obey our axioms. Um, uh. mm, so what, what I find uh, very interesting in this, um, let's say papers about data structures is that they are, um, this is a very mathematical model of, of, of data structures. Usually we think about sets and maps and these trees as um, some kind of, um, well, they, not, they are not very related to each other. They have different properties, they solve different problems. And with this approach you have, um, Mm, very principal approach to this stuff. So we have uh, equations that are uh, um, that are true in uh, different data structures. So I, I, I see beauty in this. <laughs> uh, I see that this is like good approach to think about stuff. Because if you have a mathematical model of something that this is this is some this is not ad hoc. This is not in, invented. Um, yeah, design. This is like something that exists. Um, so vibration goes even uh, deeper. I'm sorry, deeper. Gets you even more general view of these things. But I cannot any say anything more about this because I'm on the page two <laughs> <laughs> of, of of paper about this, and it's that. <laughs> But if I understand this, I will gladly present this. Sure, sure. Cool. And the vibration is something from type theory, right? Can you or it? is it from type theory, from vibration, or is it from, from category theory? From category theory. Uh, yeah. I, I've heard of vibrations, I feel like, in a different context, but um, I'm yeah. now, like, I was never very familiar or comfortable with the concept, and, uh, and I'm now wondering how closely related it is to uh, the idea of a fiber bundle from uh, topology. But I, I don't know if there's a connection or if it's like, uh, you know, a coincidence in the names or something. 
Um, oh, but one, one thing I did want to ask you is, uh, do they, is there any discussion in this like hierarchies of, of data structures about like monads or, or are they not even thinking about things in, in terms of uh, monads? They, uh, well, um, they, 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 they speak more about data structures from abstract algebra like uh, monoid. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because yeah. they they have these uh, properties, like yeah. commutative monoid and mm, stuff like that. So right. I didn't uh, saw a monad in this, those uh, papers. So yeah, monads are a bit more general, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was like abstractions are above. Right. Right. Yeah. Because like all of the data structures you mentioned are are just like instances of. Uh, Monoid or uh, monads, so yeah, I was yeah, wondering yeah. If, if maybe they would use monads somehow to like characterize them or, or you know but order it, them in a particular way. I think that monads doesn't buy you anything because you know that all of them are monads. So yeah, yeah right. It, yeah, additional it, structure. Yeah. I, yeah, that that totally makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and you, you, you have, have to respect monads. Categories of types, right? Uh, the, so the papers that I've read so far treated about abstract algebra, not uh, category theory. Now I'm getting to the ones that treat about category theory. And sorry, I can't go there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, did you did you post a link to the paper that you're talking about? Uh, I realized that I did not. <laughs> oh, so okay, I, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I'm posting this now. Mm. Oh, now watching Bartos, you know, has sort of led me to think in terms of type theory is simply a subset of category theory. It's it, it, yeah, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, categories of types that. Uh, uh, so category theory has this nice, uh, nice um, property that it is very abstract. It talks about structure, and if you so yeah, this is a very um, I think important thing. So most people say that category theory is nice because you could if you could um, like find familiar things between different branches of math or in general different. Uh, branches of knowledge, uh, you could uh, find a similar structure, like a category, you could have a functors and natural transformation, stuff like that. But prof professor from uh, Glasgow said that uh, you could take the stuff that you know about category theory, define a category from the things that you are interested in, and try to understand what would be like functor natural transformation Junctions between uh, like things, uh, can extensions, and stuff like that, and maybe you would get for free some 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 new knowledge that do not exist yet in in this I don't know field of math or branch of study like type theory, for example. This is super interesting for me. Um, I, I think that it is a big big stuff. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Jim, I mean, basically what you're talking about is the Curry-Howard isomorphism, like thinking of types as objects yeah. and uh, programs as uh, morphisms. Yeah, and, and Robert Harper uh, 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 say that uh, this is like a, like a um, holy trinity <laughs> between yeah. category theory, type theory, and uh, topology. Yeah. There, there. Are, uh, uh, yeah, he, he said that uh, if you uh, discover something important, like like something that is eternal, uh, <clears throat> you need to prove it in uh, uh, all of these three, uh, all of these three uh, like theories. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but but uh, I also read some some comments that uh, this is not the, the, like only three branches. You can you you have you have more than three, but uh, he's talking about this like a whole thing. <laughs> Right, it's, it's sort of like everything. Okay, uh, right. Oh, 
the, the category theory is general, so uh, <clears throat> uh, it contains uh, all the rest of mathematics and yeah. uh, information, right? right? Don't they call it the mathematics of yeah. mathematics? Yeah. But Jim, uh, you, you think that uh, a category theory is uh, like a broader or general uh, than type theory, for example? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's um, really, really getting, you know, getting down to first principles, basics. It's sort of amazingly magical that it works. You know, it, it seems surprising that you could, you know, start with something so simple as the definition of a category and, <laughs> uh, you know, come up with something like behavioral types, you know, I mean, uh, or, uh, 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 set theory, and, and, um, uh, whatever. Um, uh, so, um, uh, by, it, so by being so general, it, it, it's, it has limited usefulness. I mean, you know, you want to, you know, you, it, to really, at some point you have to leave category theory and go into type theory, okay, in order to, make meaningful statements, you know, uh, but uh, uh, it, it's, you know, it, you know, it's, uh, there's no, uh, it's, it's, it's not disjoint. It's, you know, all connected. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, uh, Peter, one uh, interesting thing. I, I just quickly like looked on Wikipedia about vibration and yeah. it says it's a generalization of a fiber bundle. So I know what a fiber bundle is, but I, I don't know much about vibrations. I, I would uh, love to uh, hear what's a uh, fiber bundle in homotopy, but I don't know much about homotopy, so. <laughs> I also don't know much about homotopy. Uh, yeah. I, I know it from like the stance of like point set topology um, but algebraic topology is only is, is something that I only have like very limited exposure to. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see that paper and like maybe we can we can talk about it and like uh, hopefully our our different knowledge sets can can kind of complement one another. You know, when I will be ready to talk about this fibrate data structures, I will let you. Know. I I didn't find yeah. it yet. I, I need to. Uh, I know who wrote this, so. You, you said it was called Boom Hierarchy? Uh, so uh, I've linked uh, Boom Hierarchy paper to the um, to the chat. Oh, okay, I guess. But it's uh, like a ah, okay. couple of levels. This is a starting point. This is not about fiber data types, but uh, I think that I found the right paper. Yeah, no. Uh, so I'm currently, I see that this paper is like, um, behind some restricted uh, web pages, but I've definitely found, uh, see this online, so I, I will think about this. Well, uh, what, what's it, if you just send a name or something, that would be very clear. I can, I can. Okay, I've linked the uh, direct link to the paper. Okay. Oh, so okay. yeah, I'm on the page like two or three of this. <laughs> and it, it is dense, as it is in like that. Yeah. Mm. So th th those are, uh, I'm also investigating the state box language. Is this thing? Uh, oh, it's uh, interesting. It's category language. Yeah, so. Programming with categories, right? There is a paper, but it is not uh, released yet, I believe. Uh, the same guys are involved in doing this category theory query language. It's a couple of, of different stuff. They stream in a Wednesday. Uh, about uh, different stuff like proving category theory, hydris, things like that. If you are interested, you can check them out. The, uh, you said they are streaming. Yeah, on Twitch oh. TV, there is something like that. 
but they um, stream about different things. Uh, on this week, they were streaming about type devs. This is some generic way to talk about uh, abstract data types. It's like independent of language or something like that. I didn't, I don't know much about this. Things. But yeah, you went into reflection, right? With okay, <laughs> I can't. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, I don't understand this yet. But it seems interesting for some reason. I don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, you know, th there is this thing that I'm ch sometimes interested in something. I completely don't know why, because it's not connected to anything. But then it turns out that it is connected, and I got some weird, you know, observations about things. Yeah, and, and, and studying this type of mathematics, you can't hope to know why you're studying it, and you know, before you know what it's all about, and then you start to see the connections. It's just like. Jim was saying with the category theory lectures, it's like you don't you don't make the connections until maybe two lectures afterwards. <laughs> then then things start to make sense, you know. Uh, so yeah, I guess the motivation for studying it is other people are studying it, so clearly it's interesting, right? Because like other people aren't just wasting their time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, guys. I, I need to. Uh... Uh, well, thank you for the session. That was yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Uh, Isaac, uh, uh, for, for the next time, maybe you can say something about this uh, connection with Ladle and. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe uh, I'll, uh, I'll look more into both the Ladle and, uh, and the matching logic stuff and, and maybe try to make a better case for, for why they're related. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but like I was saying before, I mean, I think like kind of the really high level, uh, relation that I see between ladle and, uh, you know, the matching logic for K framework is, uh, is they're, they're using some sort of like Boolean constructors as, um, uh, you know, for, so they're constructing some kind of like pattern language basically. And, uh, and, and in this grammar that they're constructing for patterns, uh, they're taking in, you know, Boolean constructors. So you can say like, you know, this pattern and this pattern, or you can say like this pattern mm -hmm. or this pattern, or you can say like not this pattern, something along those lines, or, or maybe with some, you know, existential or universal quantifiers from like first order logic, um, along mm -hmm. with the constructors from your language as well. Uh, and, and, and those together, I think are giving us this kind of like spatial behavioral, uh, sort of type system oh, from see, the yeah. viewpoint of like the types being, uh, the like collection of, of processes that match mm. a particular pattern. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 And, uh, uh you, you said that uh, they're using, uh, this constructors from uh, Boolean logic, but yeah. Do they have something more uh, exotic, like uh, modal operators, like diamond and box? Or uh, oh, oh, for, well, so uh, yes. So specifically with the matching logic, the, the way that they're thinking about um, something like uh, something like a, a, a modal operator is basically like implication from uh, the, mm. the Boolean constructor. Yeah, so it's like basically like mm -hmm. if you have this pattern, then that'll imply that you also satisfy this pattern. And so that's kind of like the analog of, of the modal operators, if from, from what I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, for all and exist, do they have something like for all and uh, exist? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. Yeah. This sounds very similar. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and, uh, yeah, so the, the implication is kind of like, uh, so like I was saying, that's kind of like their, their modal operator, like an analog of it. And, um, and what that gets them is now, now you have like steps that you can take throughout like proving a statement. And this is basically the, the foundation of their reachability logic. And, and, mm. and that's, and that's really just saying like, how can we, how can we take the, the operational semantics with all the rewrite rules that, that you've defined as, as, you know, like being possible or, or allowed or whatever, 
uh, and then go to prove claims about uh, transitioning from a particular, you know, initial state to a, a, a particular final state in a, in a program. Mm, yeah, yeah, this makes sense totally. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so yeah, I can I, uh, I yeah, I'll, to this paper again. <laughs> uh, which one? Uh, a later paper. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm mostly thinking uh, in terms of matching logic, like as I was uh, describing that stuff. But yeah, there there are certainly uh, some connections there, and and in, in like a in a very concrete way, I think too, because uh, because like I said, with the with the matching logic, the the pattern grammar that they're using is strictly coming from uh, their like the the boolean operators that we have. And then also from the um, like the constructs for like the constructors from the language that that we're defining, uh, and they're trying to do it in a language independent way, right? So it's just like whatever constructors you have, you can kind of incorporate these into the patterns that you're defining. Um, but in well, and, and I guess in Ladle, it's it's kind of a language independent way as well, right? Because you just have mm -hmm. some grammar for a process calculus, and then you can like take these constructs that you have for the process calculus and somehow turn them into this sort of like spatial behavioral type system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this co that you mentioned yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. In, in Ladle, that's yeah. literally what they're doing. They're, they're taking this like, uh, what, what they're calling like a two category of the, the theory of Boolean algebra. So like my understanding of what all that stuff means is basically like, you have Boolean algebra the way that you think about it. So like in terms of the, those constructors, right? Uh, you have some relations between, between those constructors. Um, and then they're taking that grammar and then doing a co-product with like the, the, you know, calculus grammar that, that you have essentially to produce the, the grammar for like the, the formula. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to go back to, to my, uh, to, to my uh, uh, implementation of uh, Greg's uh, uh, task for in, in, in his lectures about oh, uh, creating uh, uh, implementing these boolean operators on the on the lambda uh, lambda terms. Oh yeah, cool. Because n n now now I know uh, like <laughs> I know better how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I've been contemplating is, uh, you know, uh, object cap capabilities related to the ambient calculus. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I, I sort of uh, don't quite, I mean, I can see how, see, see is in essence giving permission for A to enter yeah. the namespace here. Right. Giving them capabilities. Yeah. Um, but there's something about this that's you now a synchronization right. between A and C in that you know they're agreeing to share with each other. Yeah. So I you know I think there is a object capabilities way of looking at it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, to, to me, this incapability seems related to uh, like, you know, a com event or something like a send and receive on a private channel or, or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to put it in the context of the evil of ambient, authentic, uh, ambient authority. Okay. <laughs> uh, how can you know how can we use this that doesn't act like it's access control lists which you know access control lists represent the evil of ambient authority uh, do you mind saying a few words about uh, ambient authority and, and how it relates to object capability and this access control list? Because I'm like, I'm not 100% sure what all of those terms mean. Um, well, uh, 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 object capabilities are 
generally considered to be the alternative to um, uh, uh, ambient authority. And uh, as uh, if we look, you know, we look at uh, I'm not sure who originally said it, but um, uh, I think it, I think Dan said on Saturday. Um, he said uh, uh, and where would that be? I think that was in general. You mean his uh, met metaphor with uh, car keys? He said that you know. Uh, the, Basically, the enemy isn't uh, arbitrary code ex execution is not the enemy. Enemy uh, ambient authority is the enemy. Okay, and the uh, 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 if we uh, wait, what's the context for that though? Uh, that was uh, in the context of uh, safe, uh, safety, safety, uh, okay. safe programming, access control. Uh, so, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, it's sort of the opposite. A name doesn't give you any permissions at all. I, a name, uh, but uh, I don't know. This is a pretty general definition, but uh, uh, basically, if you have you know if you have an access control list or uh, the or uh, role based uh, uh, permissions. Um, that's just, you know, an ambient, you, uh, you understand this, uh, you have an environment. You have yeah, an like an execution objects. environment, right? Right, you have a bunch of objects and they have names and the names are, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 anybody in the environment can use a name. Okay, what they can do with it, I guess, depends on... Uh, Uh, whether they can enter uh, the, you know, they can do an open if they can enter the file net domain or whatever. They can actually, you know, they, uh, um, well, in any case, <laughs> the, uh, I guess I'm trying. What I was trying to understand is how how this can be different from an access control list. Basically, we're saying this is we're, by saying that this guy can go in. We have an access control list, but at the same time, we have a a a, a, a calculus where these things are dynamic and uh, maybe uh, maybe they are they are different from access control lists. But how are they different? I don't think I explained that very well, but uh, that's the basic idea. And then um, I uh, uh, am looking at how uh, we can, uh, what patterns we can use to handle ambient in rolling. Clearly, you know, uh, if we have, you know, like a virtual world, that has things in it, and we can go around and we can enter things and we can discover or whatever. You know, th this is ambience, you know, and some things we can enter, some things we can't enter. Okay, the ambient model uh, is necessary for that kind of uh, exploration, so to speak, of an environment. Um, so, uh, what are the patterns in row calculus for doing that? And uh, uh, but then I got distracted and I got into the situation calculus and um, the whole problem of uh, uh, 
of uh, 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 you know how we handle fluids, the you know, things that are time dependent. Um, so I didn't get far with that, but I, you know if it seems to be related to uh, uh, the whole thing of time and time not being really part of the rough calculus. Uh, there's the notion of emergent time. But um, I realize it's late, but <laughs> I wanted to run this by you guys see if you have any thoughts on these things that, I'm, uh, that are keeping me awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we can we can pretty much do anything we want to do in, in uh, the row calculus. I just I, I feel like some of these other uh, patterns or ways of looking at these problems may be more conducive to our um, you know rapid deployment of this stuff, like the uh, the ambient calculus seems like. It, it's something that we could we could make use of right away. Uh, can you can you just add something like that to the row calculus? Can you can you build an ambient calculus in the row calculus and and just in, just use it when you need it? In, in theory, you can, but uh, I, I I I think I mean uh, I don't see anything there. I'm I'm more concerned. I'm more concerned with how we can handle the situation calculus, which is sort of similar in some way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's related to all this stuff that, that Greg's been talking about. <coughs> and it may be a better way to look at this, this problem of, of uh, uh, what do you call them, transients or? Uh, could, could be fluent. Fluence. Fluence, so, ambience, growth. And uh, how do you uh, translate uh, uh, ambient calculus to, to row calculus without uh, substitution in, inside the uh, ambient calculus? I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure how can I think about this translation. So do you have any idea? Uh, and then what, what do you get from this uh, translation? I'm not say, thinking so much of a translation as a uh, as a uh, implementation. Yeah, as a pattern that that does everything that the ambient calculus does, but right. we don't necessarily have to worry about translation. It, it's all handled right. in the in the grammar. Implementation of ambience. Yeah. Which is you know like an application written in row line. Is there is there a is there a toy model of what we want to do here that could could show us how we would want to go about this? You know, just in a very simple case. I mean, can you can we see uh, this uh, uh, when one ambient uh, is allowed to to enter another ambient? Is this uh, the very similar to uh, uh, sending the, the process to another process and, you know, this process can then respond? In, in a well, sense, you know, in context to another process. As far as I can see, you know, there would have to be a namespace, which I guess we could implement as a, uh, <coughs> as a map or, you know, a, a bunch of processes in parallel, whatever. Uh, however, we could implement a namespace in Rowland. Well, a, a namespace is just a, a list of names, isn't it? Right. It's just basically, yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, 
Uh, well, well it's, it's like a pattern that you can match with yeah. specific names. So like if you match the pattern, then then that name's in the namespace. Right. So it doesn't have to be. So it could be a list of names, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it could be a list of names, but it could be yeah. much, much more uh, structured than that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and you know, and um, that's uh, uh, and so you know, the ambient the ambient calculus is pretty simple in that it just gives access to names, and if there's any more structure, then you have to enter the the ambient and get more names in order to do something. But uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, um, I mean, we can think of it as uh, uh, an ambient as, as having a map of names, mm -hmm. right? But you can think of it that way. Okay, the situational calculus uh, sort of interrupted my th thinking there and doing uh, that because of the real problem with handling fluents. And I think that um, um, in, you know, in modeling real situations, uh, we have to be able to, uh, we, we need a, a pattern to handle situation calculus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and then, you know, uh, uh, in essence, it, within in an ambient, we have a situation, right? <laughs> um, but Jim, you, you think that uh, <clears throat> thinking for uh, uh, in terms of uh, ambient calculus is easier to understand these problems than just thinking in rolling? Is this right? I th I think that's what it is. Is what what is this? Is this called uh, expressiveness? Is this yeah, what ambient calculus turned complete? I mean, I I just don't know much about the ambient calculus. Oh yeah, I'm I'm sure it's turing complete. I mean, I yeah, okay. I, I, I it, it's just another um, pi calculus. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that right? Yeah. Process calculus. It's a flavor of pi calculus that. That, because I'm, I'm thinking that uh, in, in ambient calculus, uh, there is no reflection, right? So I see this as a, like a... Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. I, I mean, this the main thing is... Sorry? Yeah, I guess I was just, I was imposing it on it. I thought it was reflected. Well, not I, if, it, I, not I if it's a pi calculus, right? Because I'm, I'm thinking, what is the structure of this name? Like, yeah. uh, if we have this <clears throat> this construct uh, to in uh, and open and different these different kinds of uh, as uh, as Isaac mentioned, it's very similar to send and receive. So I'm thinking that uh, maybe it's this much more restrictive in in the terms of uh, pi calculus, where names don't have structure. So in that sense, uh, maybe it is expressive, but Maybe uh, problems uh, expressed in in uh, in, in uh, ambient calculus doesn't. Maybe there is not. Maybe uh, they will not be uh, easier to understand, right? Well, because an ambient is a concept. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, your uh, laptop on you know or your computer is an ambient, right? It's like an analogous thing. So, to so, so you want to uh, 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 you want to perform, you know, uh, operations on it, and you want to write them in Rolang, okay? But in Rolang, there has to be some concept of your computer or an, this ambient uh, that has an inside and an outside. Um, uh, uh, yeah, this is almost like we, we want to come up with some, uh, what's the expression, sugar, syntactic sugar for Rolang that will allow us to yeah. well, uh, manipulate you know, these ambient patterns. 
and you know it's a it, it has to do with natural systems okay in other words my computer is a name in this room no as an ambient okay as the light and the you know the, the, the picture and this chair and all these things are thing, you know things that are in this ambient environment that I can explore or whatever okay so um, um, uh, and then uh, you know in the computer there's files and programs and other ambience uh, type things uh, okay so um, it's not so much a matter of formally supporting the ambient calculus, but right. the, just the, the concept of ambience and, uh, uh, and, and traversing an environment and discovering an environment. That, you know, how do you do that in real life? Um, but, you know, it, uh, 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 and, uh, um, So you would, you would like to have uh, uh, these uh, construct, constructions from uh, ambient calculus it, it, as a right. syntactic sugar in rolling to... And then, and then, you know, within each environment, we have a situation. What's the situation in this room? Okay, and that brings us to the situation calculus. And the problem of... Uh, the problem of... Uh, Fluence, and uh, can you can you say something about, about uh, this problem? Uh, why it's uh, difficult, and uh, you, you mentioned that it's related to time. Uh, right, uh, right. Fluence, uh, fluence uh, uh, have a uh, are parametric in time, um, and we don't have any we don't have anything like that so i'm trying to think of you know what is there a different situation calculus that doesn't have fluence or do we need you know how do we uh, 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 and uh uh, are they necessary? If we're, you know, I mean, they ex fluence exists in the real world, so we have to be able to represent them. You know, and it, it comes back to this natural systems modeling uh, 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 requirement, so to speak. Uh, hmm. uh, having patterns to uh, to handle these uh, because uh, time time is also like something that uh, you need to uh, you need to have permission to to access right or or randomness or something like that uh, th this is something that you need to uh, uh, you need to have a right to this capability right You cannot get time just by some something uh, internal. This is something that you need. To... Yeah, uh, you know, there's there's a notion of uh, local time, uh, or there can be a, a notion of local time in an ambient. I guess within an ambient, you can uh, right. You would. You could have time or not have time, right? But you know, basically, let's say uh, you've got a uh, you know a firecracker object, and it has an operation like the fuse. Okay, so if in some environment you can do, you know, you can access the like the fuse of the firecracker, then in three seconds it has to explode, right? <laughs> it yeah. has to have some way of determining you know, what three seconds are. <laughs> yeah. And it could be that, you know, by burning the fuse, that process of burning the fuse is going to use the time 
that it takes to blow up. <laughs> mm. But that goes back to the whole thing of scheduling, and you know we haven't even addressed that. Although, uh, oh, yeah. this can this can be like a local time, right? You 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 are creating time from a sequence of uh, what se sequence of actions on 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 this uh, physical material, right? Yeah, but the, you know, uh, with non-deterministic scheduling, we don't, you know, that doesn't work. We have to, we have to have, we have to have frequencies associated with processes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, when when you when you express uh, some chemical reaction like uh, a burning of of uh, uh, of, of, of this uh, firecracker, right? Uh, uh, this is. This is not like a sequence of of this chemical reaction, right? But you know uh, how will how will uh, how will react, right? In 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 this uh, atmosphere, or right? Can we can we relate uh, any of this to to Greg's discussion of the space time calculus? Is that is the time that that you're talking about the same time that he's talking about in the same space time calculus? Not exactly, but it's related. It's like if we can, you know, if we can easily get the notion of time out. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, th I think we we need. Um, We're going to need to have uh, uh, scheduling as part of our expression, logical expression, in terms of uh, 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 scheduling what? Well, you know, sort of like the way the brain works. Okay, the highest priority things are at the highest frequency. And that highest frequency thing is what's conscious. Okay, everything else is unconscious. <laughs> um, uh, uh, mm. In uh, uh, You know, where would the scheduler we, go? We have the one thing now that we, you know, that something can run out of gas. That's the only time like thing we have that something can run out of gas. And, and then we don't even have a way of determining that something ran out of gas. <laughs> but um, the, uh, 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 my, con I contend that we have to, we have to embrace time. And uh, it's going to be in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, frequency of expression or the relative frequency of expression. Um, we have lists and we, we do one thing from this list and then one thing from that list. What, uh, uh, we do it. Uh, 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 you know, for every, you know, it's two things here, we do one thing here. For every two things here, we do one thing here. For every two things here, we do one thing here. Um, so we, we have a, 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 a. Is that, is that uh, two things here and one thing here? That's an example, really. It's just a but. A, but a, what a I'm saying priority, is priority queue. Uh, but who who is the who is the who is conscious? Who is the consciousness that would <clears throat> would that's worry the, about these? That's the node. That each and, node is, is. Yeah, and the other thing is, I mean, we need locality. I mean, time is local, so. There's no the no notion of no time comes in there. Um, 
so like each node has its own notion of time right yeah okay and uh, 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 you know that can, that ultimately can be utilized when uh, uh, when in negotiating a consensus of ordering right mm -hmm. Jim, I, I was thinking about your example with uh, ticketing, which is uh, really, uh, we, we need this, this kind of uh, sequencing, right? Right. And uh, I, I see this connected to, to uh, very, very similar to time, right? But we need, uh, we need some, some uh, synchronization, right? So uh, I can imagine that we, we have a, a, like a general purpose uh, uh, namespace uh, where, where everything is concurrent and, you know, uh, and this is what we want, right? But uh, sometimes we need something like ticketing. Uh, so in that in that case, uh, we we could have exactly the the, the same network, uh, which is doing like almost similar thing to to what now is uh, is doing like Bitcoin. It's 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 not a, a deck. It's 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 a chain, right? It's a chain of sequence. So we can have uh, validators. Uh, 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 that are optimized and consensus protocol that is optimized for uh, uh, sequencing. So each validator can just uh, use this uh, other network uh, 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 for, for the next ticket number, right? For, for wherever you are, you, you know that uh, uh, this is like a global sequencing network. You just reach to the network and say, uh, give me next number. And each call will get the next number because this network is optimized for sequencing. So in that sense, uh, this this network is uh, like an oracle for 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 a concurrent network. Yeah. Well, global, uh, but it's also global consensus is very expensive. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but the, if scheme, it, the scheme I have in mind is that channels are local. Channels have a locality. They have a home. Okay, and that corresponds to the node where they were generated. Okay, and I mean, it can get complicated, but basically the, uh, um, um, the uh, a common event, okay, is bi-local, just like in physics. <laughs> okay, you have a send and receive that are in some frame, they're instantaneous, you know, the photon. Um, and uh, by and that synchronization, okay. Um, but how, you, how can how can you decide uh, what came first in in these settings? Because I think it's uh, you you don't have uh, all the necessary things to do. Because first of all, you don't have there's only, there's right? only local there's only local ordering. But okay. you, you will need that, that you com need. event. A com event is the synchronization between two locations. Okay, so there. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you have is the ordering of events in any location is 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 can, is never contradicted anywhere it's like if i uh if i count one two three no observer anywhere is going to hear me count three two one yeah every observer is going to agree that i said one two three so um uh, that uh the channels are associated with locality Um, uh, is what, uh, well, let's put, okay, the idea that, that the send and receive is instantaneous, basically faster than, I mean, it's light speed, but globally, it's the it's relative, it's instantaneous. Okay, I, 
at light speed, it takes no time, no distance, right? The, uh, the fact that causality is preserved in spite of these instantaneous connections. Yeah, but we have, uh, we have disconnected uh, machines. Right, we, we, we have a Casper consensus uh, uh, between. So uh, it's very difficult because uh, if, uh, uh, if, if you change the proposed time, you, you completely change the, the ordering of everything, right? If, if one validator uh, uh, like proposes uh, every 10 minutes, you will never be uh, in, in order. What I'm suggesting is, what I'm suggesting is that channels are local. Okay, so if there's a total somewhere, it has a location. It's associated with a node. Okay, and when you write to that name, it writes to that node. Now, if the no that node's not available, okay, there has to be a rule, you know, for uh, uh, getting uh, uh, a, uh, a consensus about uh, from the neighbors about what that node would likely say. Okay, that, you know, you have to get a neighborhood consensus. Um, uh, but that, you know, that's another problem. But if we just think of it simply, okay, and this is the system we, the, 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 the decentralized system we built in the 80s. It's like, the, you know, the objects had a location and you always sent the message to that location. Okay, so, um, and, you know, copy control, and other, things, uh, other things were, you know, uh, uh, on top of that. Um, uh, well, let me, are, you, are you sending this locally or uh, because I think this is important to, to say uh, is this message uh, sent to like part of the consensus or it, it is like a local change uh, that must be synchronized? Um, this, uh, the, uh, uh, the node that owns the channel is going to run the um, the com event. But uh, uh, it gets run by local. What, what do you mean a node uh, owns the channel? Because every node is the same, right? We, well, we all. We, I'm, uh, I'm saying that the, the, the names are local; they belong to nodes. Well, in the in the sense of this space time that Greg's talking about, th this location is not no. It has nothing to do with node. It has to do with namespace, right? Right. So well, this is. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I'm 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 breaking no, namespace down to um, uh, to uh, and to and associating it with the node. And I guess I, uh, it's getting late. Um, uh, it's 1 p.m. now. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to uh, have to I'm go. Gonna, I'm going to read up about those two calculus that you talked about because I think that's very interesting where this discussion is going. But hmm. anyway, thanks, everybody. I, I guess it's time for me to go anyway. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right, right. See you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>